last one is getting married, it has to be my deal and my support. So my engagement became a sentence. And I have to my now, when we come to Joseph, Joseph's father Rachel, who was supposed to be the wife, now was sidelined, and Leah became the best wife. And Rachel would not have children after all, a rejection and all the challenges that she, uh, she had to go through. And finally she said, Jacob, if you don't give me a child, I'm going to die. Give me a child or I die. Finally, gave them to Joseph. And here comes the glory of God manifesting in Joseph. How dreams of the great thing that's going to come many years later. All right? And the brothers decided to hate him. And they decided to and let's see what will happen to him. But Joseph had a spirit of forgiveness, and no matter how much rejection was coming against him, he feared the Lord. And the fear of God is what makes you feel in the face of the in the face of the in the face of So, Reuben says, don't let us kill him, but let us tell him to, let us drop him to the knees. From there on, we are cousins from the other side of uh, Abraham, that is uh, Was a negator, an intercessor, 
And you know, just before they will get to meet with, with, uh, with, 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 with Joseph, something happened to Judah. Judah, first son, you know, married her. And uh, didn't like the woman, so would not allow the woman to get a child. And then he died. Then Onan, the second born, will take over. And he will also practice some wickedness against Tim. And he also died. And
You know, it's easy to turn your back on the bed. But what you don't realize is that when you turn your back on the bed, love is healed. You start having funny dreams. Because here comes Mr. Satan. He's just looking for a way to bastardize families. He's looking for a way to destroy marriages. He's looking for a way to make you feel the person with whom you stood before the altar and swore a covenant for better for worse. Suddenly, that person has become your enemy. Whether you like it or not, when the teeth grinds on the tongue, you don't take a knife and cut it and throw it away. So here comes Judah, the very tongue that said, don't kill him. Let us rather sell him into slavery. Will not be the one who, at a time when he did something wrong, will say, hey, I have sinned. It's not the lady. It's my fault. Just in preparation to go to Egypt, and now see Joseph. Ha! Huh. He didn't even know that was Joseph, but was able to stand before Jacob and say, If I don't bring back your son Benjamin, kill me in his place. Intercession is a place where you start to say, No matter the challenge, no matter the difficulty, because of the fear of God, I'm going to stand. So intercession is turning in the gap. We, C-A-F-B-L-C, we are standing in the gap for every man on earth who has not been appreciated, who has not been honored, who has not been rewarded for the good you have done, for your community, for people who are less privileged in life. So whoever you are, as you celebrate you tonight, we are celebrating you because we are standing in the gap to say, God has forgiven your errors. God has forgiven your mistakes. It's just for you to identify what you did wrong. And we are appreciating you, whether big or small. We are saying that on behalf of Dr. D.K., C-A-F-B-L-C, is saying, God loves you. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. And so, please, wherever we are falling short, forgive us. Wherever we are making mistakes, forgive us. Wherever we didn't get it perfect, forgive us. But one thing we don't. Like Judah, we are, God, we are saying that, hey, no matter the challenges, no matter the difficulties, we want to recognize whatever you have done in this world. Because... For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Forgiveness expands your blessing. So, many years later, great grand 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 grandson of Judah, whose name was Jabez, was born in sorrow. But the Bible described him as a man who was more honorable than any other person in the family. Why was he honorable? Though he was born in pain, in sorrow, he stood and said, God, change my name. This morning, we want to tell you that as you receive the award, your name is being changed. Amen. Your work is being changed. Amen. Whatever has gone wrong in your life is being changed. Jabez said, Lord, I will no longer be referred to as a child of sorrow. Amen. I am a child of blessing. That you will bless me indeed. That you will expand my goals. Which means that don't let the blessing stop with me. Remember my brothers. Remember my sisters. This morning, Dr. DK is saying, if God has blessed me, I'm remembering you. I am remembering you. I am remembering you. C A F B L C. Joining her to Dr. DK. We are letting you know that God is expanding our blessing to be extended to you. So when you get the blessing, please, don't keep it to yourself. Say, I will seek to see ALBLC, B-L-C, and I will support C-A-L-B-L-C. You will support Dr. D.K. You will support the organization because you want the blessing to be expanded. And, you know, Jeffrey said, God, that's your hand will be upon me. What kind of hand? The hand of favor. Let us all 
favor Dr. Dike. Let us extend love to him. Let us encourage him. Don't call and say, you blessed my nose, you didn't bless my ears. You know, before I married, I went through that. You preach, you minister, somebody's eyes is healed, their nose is healed, miracles have happened, instead of them to call you and say, oh, thank you for your prayers. They'll say, you prayed for my nose. You didn't pay for my knees. <laughs> <laughs> I am here in my hotel room by myself. What is happening? We don't want that to happen to Dr. Let us all learn to appreciate him at the end of the day. Let us all learn to support him at the end of the day. So Joseph stood firm and said, I am Joseph whom you sold in slavery. Don't get angry with yourself. God purposes for such a time. And he says, Come, hug me. All right? He hugs the same friend that so into to say, Carry forgiveness wherever you go. Let it be at hand in your heart, in your bosom, in your character, in your behavior, in everything you do. So, today, I want to say, Let's pray. Paul, to come say a word of prayer for us. Amen. Let us pray. Please, Mr. Father, we want to thank you for this word that we received. You say the entrance of your word, bring illumination. We thank you because we have been lighted up. Lord, we want to commit this meeting into your hands, the rest of the meeting into your hands. We pray, not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. We ask your spirit to lead us. We pray, oh God, that our being here will never be in vain. But every minute of our being here will be controlled by your spirit. Thank you for the people that you brought together for the purpose of enlightening us. And we pray that may our spirit be open so that we might receive everything, even through friendship, through relationship, through what we are going to hear. We lift up the name of the Lord, and we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor for hearing and answering these prayers. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now before I hand over the microphone, Dr. Dike, please introduce Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. A pleasant good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is my distinguished honor and privilege to welcome you to our 2022 African and Caribbean International Leadership Conference, hosted by the Caribbean and African Faith-Based Leadership Conference. Um, please um, let me pause just to request that we have more seats in here as others are coming in. Normally, when we have the conference, um, we would have it perhaps in a Marriott. Folks would stay in their room, manicure, pedicure, makeup, <laughs> for the gala night. You will send folks to knock at doors and the numbers are not so. Because of that, we underestimated how many persons would really come especially knowing that you are not inside the hotel at this time. So I am indeed impressed um, to see that you have made the effort to be here, and I know that there are many others on your way to be here. Our last event was held December 4th in New York City, where we had our international symposium and awards gala, with approximately 450 people in attendance. And one of the things that was very impressive about that was that because we normally have the conference in collaboration with the White House and the reception at the White House, we always felt that the White House was the draw because the registration level for the White House would be very, very high. 
and you would see a lot of people gather for the White House, but not for the conference itself. And so you would see a lot of people gather for the White House briefing and reception, the gala dinner, but not the conference. And that used to bother me. And one of the reasons why it used to bother me is because the conference is always so rich, um, with so much rich information, and the folks would come so close and miss everything. And sometimes I hear folks reach out to me and they say, Dr. DK, but how could I get a grant? How could I, my church is having this issue and I need a grant um, from Homeland Security or we have a safety and security issue. I said, well, you were at a conference. The Homeland Security people are here. They gave out the grant forms, but you missed it. And there are just so many things that people ask about and they missed out on it. And I am happy that today you are among those that will not miss out on the essential ingredients of our conference. I want you to put your hands together for being here. I want to congratulate you for being here. We are truly survivors of a great pandemic and God has favored us to be here. I want to specially recognize and empathize on those who have traveled from parts of Africa and the Caribbean to be here. And I know that tonight is going to be a full house. May God help us tonight. Yes. Um, I was privileged to travel to some of your countries during the COVID, to about five countries in Africa, including Sierra Leone, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya. And um, um, I know that we have great representation from those countries. And I look forward to come to more countries after the conference and do more um, in the Caribbean. So we are making arrangements to have more seats, and we are looking forward to a very, very great event this year. So I want to thank you for coming, want to welcome you all. And um, this conference is very special. Recently, uh, the organization has been certified by the White House to issue the U.S. President's Lifetime Achievement Award, which is one of the highest civic award in this country that an individual can receive. The President's Lifetime Achievement Award is award for voluntary and outstanding community and civic service and participation in the United States. And it's an award that is issued to you both by the President and the U.S. government. And God has favored us with the privilege to make the selections of the stakeholders in our community that are making a difference. And I just want to pause to say to all those who are our honorees who will be receiving the award this evening that you are among the great number this evening. And you, you are being selected not because of your beauty, not because of wealth, fame, or popularity, but because you truly serve. And I just want to shout out to the committee that has been working from January to evaluate your bios, do all the background checks, make all the phone calls to ensure that you really serve. And one of the challenges we have is that there are folks that feel more comfortable to be honored with five or 10 people together. But the African Caribbean population in this country is over 14 million of us here in this country with over 12,000 African Caribbean churches throughout the United States of America. And we have leaders from the medical, the science, education, numerous fields that are really transforming our community. And one of the things the federal government doesn't know, and we need to let them know by telling our story, is that the black immigrant population in this country is a very dynamic population. We have the highest numbers of black medical professionals, the highest number of technology and we are among the fastest growing clergy population with churches we are a missionary diaspora and so you have African Caribbean churches and other religious groups popping out all over the United States of America and we have to tell our story and one of the things please just understand that you are a special impacting your world in your community and it is impossible to honor five to ten people mm. because we would never get to you until the next 20 years. 
and that is one of the reasons why 100 persons will be receiving the honor from the President of the United States. This year. I will not say much more, but it's happy to see you all here. The speakers every year, it is a tradition of the conference to identify speakers, not because of their how eloquent they are or how dynamic they are, but because they have served. We want to use our speakers as ambassadors. So the people that serve, that we honor, are the same people that we allow to be the speakers each year. And so at this time, we're going to invite, we should have had the tables for the panel. I'm not sure what's happening to that. Um, can someone help us with that? What? The tables, we're supposed to have the chairs for the panel. Um, I think we can Yes, I think the some reason is standing with the press club. And it was, we went over that over and over. But anyway, um, I'm going to indicate who our um, panelists are. These, some of them I have visited in Africa, but these are people that are making a difference. They have traveled all the way from Africa, some of them to be here. Only one of our speakers is not here from Zimbabwe, the heads of all the churches of Zimbabwe. He's still on the route to be here. But we have with us today, we are going to go into a discussion on strategic bundles for mission partnerships through faith-based organizations. Strategic models for mission partnerships through faith-based organizations. And coming to us, we will have Pastor Francis Mambu, General Overseer, Faith Healing Bible Church Worldwide, Sierra Leone. Reverend Dr. Ezekiel Curtis, Overseer Port Antonio, Bible, Open Bible Church in Jamaica, where I am from. Bishop Paul Aku, I know I'm going to get that. I'm born and raised there. I'm going to give my credit to Nigerians as well. I'm from one thing you can't tell Nigerians is that you're from Jamaica when your father is from Nigeria. This is not accepted in your culture. Okay, so we have Bishop Paul Aku Nia, and he's all the way from Togo, a French speaking country close to Ghana in West Africa. And he's the preside and he is the presiding bishop of the Praise Chapel International Churches. And we have with us Reverend Dr. Steve Mensa, who I visited the head of the Charismatic Evangelical Ministry in Accra, Ghana. We are blessed to have these amazing honorees, and they are going to come and share with us. They are going to give us perspective from what they do. Some of them are models in the area of mental health, in the area of agriculture, different areas. And we are going to invite them to come and share with us at this time. Um, Dr. Ogoje, can you report, please? Um, I just want to finally introduce our moderator, who is Dr. Julia Ogoji. And she has been a foundation member of this organization. I remember in the past, I saw that she worked with the White House because of how often she had to attend meetings there with us. And she has traveled in Africa, done numerous mission work, led the Nigerian um, Nurses Association, and has done a lot, done research in lifestyle modification, and is very active in the Catholic faith and the ecumenical faith community and is one of our global humanitarian honorees this evening. And so we ask for to be a virtual and we will now invite the other members of the panel to come at this time. Pastor Francis Mambu. <laughs> and Dr. Ezekiel Curtis, can you join us at the table? Pastor Paul Akunia and Reverend Steve Mensa. <laughs> Steve Mensa is around. 
Okay. Can someone um can someone call and check on Reverend Mensa? Um, maybe our VIP director, can you reach out and check on him, please? Dr. Ogoji? Thirty years ago, 
It was very difficult to preach the gospel. As a matter of fact, I was arrested nine times for preaching the gospel. And they call it noise. What they beat. People who are selling alcohol and the men can put their stuff outside making noise. They don't call that noise. But anyone that comes in to clap hands and be encouraged by it, they say, we were making noise. But thank the Lord for years of uh, sacrifice. And one of the things that the Lord led us to do uh, was to possess the land. I realized that in those days that the Methodist Church, the Anglican Church, they enter into a territory and they enter with education, the head knowledge, but not using what I call strategical spiritual warfare. Because you've got to get the land before you get the land. In the Old Testament, when the Lord asked the people to go in and possess the land, he said, and possess the people, he said, get the land. Why? Every human being eat out of the land. And when the land spiritually is being guarded, you find out that the people are more easy to be touched. And so what we needed to do was to go in and the Lord the land directed us to go in into the borders. And in total, we have about three borders. The border with Ghana, the border with Burkina Faso, and the border with the Nepali. And we have to go in there and pray. And we did what I call the spiritual power. Because the country was um, filled with the worshiping of Buddha. It was like Haiti. Every September, even up to now, they, they still come to Togo for the uh, National Voodoo Conference. And this power, knowingly or unknowingly, was turning against the land. That was why other places like Nigeria, Ghana, they were all revived. But Togo was not. Because there was a power standing against Togo because of the forefathers that have dedicated the land to the worshiping of idols. And little do we know that this was standing against the land from progressing. But thank be to God after we begin to deal with those forces. I believe some of us who are pastors, we will understand what I'm talking about. And opening the gate. Because anywhere you go to, before I came into the United States, I needed a visa. And I have to pass through the custom and immigration. They need to allow you to come in by the visa. In the realm of the spirit also, we have the same thing. All truth are parallel, both in the spirit and the physical. And I found out when Jesus Christ came in, in Psalm 24, he went in and he said, lift up your head, O he gives you everlasting Lord, he that lifted up so that the king of kings will have to come in. So he deal with those gates and the orders that were there before he had an access. The gate is a spiritual embodiment that the enemy put in place in order to restrict us, in order to confine us. I believe those were the gates that were standing against the land. But with the prayers, by the grace of God, the land was liberated. Amen. And I found out that we were able to have an access. I didn't even know what I was doing. One day I was praying. The Lord asked me to pick the sand from the ground. And he said, this is good. I was surprised. My spiritual father never taught me that. I was brought up by the Archbishop and the host. And we were only on speaking the faith. But we did not go in into those strategical spiritual warfare prayers. And when I took the sign, you know, on that very high unction praying, and I heard in my spirit speak that is totally in the hands. And I started speaking. I said, Total, you will not reject me. You will receive me. You will not reject the gospel. You will receive the gospel. And I keep praying. And I throw away the sign. It was later on I found out what I was doing. 
that I was doing some certain things in the spirit without me knowing. When a friend of mine who is from the land, he needed to have some permission to do some certain things. He went into Germany and Brazil and they refused him a visa. Whereas no one has ever refused me a visa from any country that I went to, even though I, I was still carrying the passport from Nigeria. And then I was talking to him and say, why? And then I heard from my spirit, the land recognizes you. Amen. And I said, why? He said, from that day that you spoke to the land. From that day, you decided to go down and begin to open the gates and the hindrances, the spiritual embodiment that stands against the country, the land begins to recognize you. And that is why anything you want in the land, the land brings it out. It might look like that's something that some of us will say, why? But I realize that when the Anglican churches and the uh, Presbyterian church started getting into some places because they did not understand that the churches did not last. The churches could not grow because the land was fighting the forces of the land. One of the things that Jesus said when he mentioned church, the first time he mentioned church, he says, the gate of hell shall not prevail. And so most of the time, even in our businesses, and whatsoever we do, most of the time, those gates. And that's why I define the gate as a spiritual embodiment that the enemy put in place to restrict you, to hinder you from possessing your possession. And so that was the later we started. And our for now, today we have almost churches all over the, the land, which was not like that before. And anywhere we go to, we apply the strategy to speak to the land with this praise that the land will give up whatsoever his old man in the realm of the spirit. Because whatever you see in the physical is that from the spirit. Life is spiritual. And most of the time we struggle with some certain things without understanding that it is being held over there. And the second thing that we did and have fun of that it works for us. The ministry God gave to me told me go and fetch them. That's why my name of the ministry is called Go Fetch Them Ministry International. And that was evangelical and mission thing. And so what we were doing in the land, it would surprise you we heard about all these big uh, evangelists. The first Outside crusade we had with Bonke, it was 1991. Whereas in some countries like Ghana, Togo, well, in Ghana, Nigeria, and uh, South Africa, even in the 60s, they started having crusade. So it was from there because the place was closed up. And so we started going in anywhere we go into, we will first and foremost evangelize the place. And this evangelism was only because Togo is one of the poorest in the West Africa, the people who were, who were introducing the method of Jesus. We come out with stuff, second-hand clothing, food, and that was helping us to make the people open up. And so everywhere we go to, sometimes we have some medical friends who will come along with us, and we added up all that and then we preached the word and the place started opening one by one. So the glory of God, I don't know what time that <laughs> one second. I found out that it pays off. And we are living in a place that um, I have a key of schools outside the, the tree more houses. By the grace of God, we are reaching out to the people and building some certain places for them that they can also go in and have a decent place for school. God bless you.
Thank you so much. So we have we have we have less than 45 minutes to go, and we have about 10 to 15 minutes question and answer. So please, participants, I uh, want to get your permission so that we put our questions together at the end of the presentation so we can ask our questions. So we'll get back to you. Thank you so much for that uh, powerful perspective. You know, you're very strategic. We can hear that in, in your ministry. So we can go. Sure. All right. Moderator, Mother, fellow panelists, participants, good morning to you all. Good morning. I call today for me and Jamaica come to the kingdom at such a time as this because I expect to learn from you as you learn from me. I also want to see today. Um, in the words of uh, coming out of First Chronicles 12, 22, where he talks about the 200 men from the tribe of Issachar who understood the times as to what Israel should do. And I believe we get a year in that respect to learn from one another based on the time that we are in. All right, I come with 46 years of service in Christian ministry, 30 years in the public school system, also as a teacher in a Bible school and as a church planter. Um, planting churches in three communities, but the substantive community is the Greater Augustum community we have served for 34 years, retired last November, and I just focus mainly on that community because it is in that community that I had to engage in various activities. Now, this community is located in Kingston, St. Andrew, near to the major university, University of the West Indies. And this community has um, rich cultural heritage, however, it is plagued by varying societal hills, the foremost one being crime and violence. I have, have made entrance to ministry in 1980, 1987, and my, what should I call it now, my introduction to the community was not very nice. Because when I moved in, three men were slain just in close proximity to where I had to reside. And throughout these 34 years in that community, there has been a perennial problem of crime and violence. Consequently, as a pastor, I had to um, use my initiative to come up with a number of strategic plans to help this community. So one of the first things that I did was to um, pioneer the starting of a minister's fraternal because I believe that as ministers, even though we may have all distinctives, we need to find a common ground where we can work social change for development um, in the community. So we have spent years upon years working with rivaling factions. And just to tell you that having gone through being the, what I call the facilitator for discussion with rivaling factions, I was impressed to purchase a building, a building, um, strictly for community activities. So that building, we use it for um, evening classes, for adults to upgrade themselves, as well as for counseling, and we also use it for uh, primary school students 
where we're going to be a fellow example moving to high school. And we partner with um, various organizations to provide um, furnishing and educational materials. For example, we partner with United, United Way, we partner with the University of the West Indies, we partner with Heart Trust, MTA, they provide a resource persons, they provide furnishings, and I'm happy to tell you that we had good success coming out of that, um, that institute. So we bought as a church, we took on the responsibility to take a mortgage to purchase that building strictly for community purpose. And I tell you the people, very, very appreciative. But to tell you the truth, it is that running as we want today because prior to COVID, prior to COVID, we had two significant outbreak of violence. And once you find there's an absurd violence, the people's interests drop. So I am not there anymore now. I retired from that church and I thought I would enjoy retirement when I'm calling you to take on another church since you see on the program that I'm in Port Antonio. So I'm feeling there. So, so my ministry uh, has been in inner city working with gangs, um, also helping with the to uh, help children with education. For example, we have our, at our church, we have um, almost every Sunday, we give out funds to the children to assist them with bus fare, lunch money, etc. Now we to see many of them graduated and they are now professionals um, in the world today. So that is where we are concentrated on right now. But just to cap by saying this, that Jamaica has some very serious challenges right now, and I hope to learn from you as you learn from me. One, the crime and violence is a serious matter. Um, number two, the dependency syndrome is a serious matter. Three, the brain drain. The brain drain is a serious matter. And four, the need for assistance of many to access tertiary level education. So those are some challenges. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. So we're going to Mama Africa next so that she can share some perspective on the strategies she's using Again, that great name, Mama Africa. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here. I thank God for Dr. Dike, who didn't give up on me, kept on calling me to come. Normally, I'll be very honest, I don't participate in the award ceremony. I'm just, you know, a donkey for Jesus, but God mandated me to be here so that I can share simple strategy that will indeed change communities and change the nations. I was going to share to show you videos, uh, pictures, but because of time. It is very, very easy for us to meet and pray and talk about it. God is simple. He gave a simple strategy that on the same day, all over the world gave him thanks because he has heard our prayers. He has heard your prayers. Now, one of his strategies, his children, his people, to give him praise, to give him thanks, it is a reality to surrender. So what have we done? Since he wrote that strategy on this specific day, we have gone into nation teaching leaders, church leaders, government leaders, all leaders, training them to renew how they think. Romans 8 to say, transform your mind. Once you change a person how they think, change from the inside. Transformation is very easy because I'm saying through experience what we have done. Second, when we train leaders, when they change and they unite, and this unity doesn't come by saying we are united, we unite, we are one. 
God is strategic. He gave a specific day. Now, how did he give that specific day? He wrote on the wall from 1993 to 2006 dates. Copy. They were changing the from 1993 to 2006. We copied those dates. Now, many of you, you heard concerning the millennium when they say what will happen. We were confident because already God has spoken. God has already shown the date. Those dates, every date from 1993 to 2006, were all the same as the third Saturday of the month. Don't ask me why the third Saturday. I don't know. I'm saying what God wrote. Now, on those days, when everybody just worship God, and when we train the leaders, God starts giving leaders strategies how to help the youth, how to help women. We have seen changes. Let me say about Togo, where he said, we were in Togo training leaders. When we left to go to Benin, Benin, they had a, a monument to worship the Buddhists. We made a declaration, hear me again. It is the leaders, the church in the leaders. When you speak, God hears. Now, when you speak in unity, when one speaks here, when one speaks there, it doesn't happen. That's why chaos continues. God is ready. This is our time. We keep on saying this is our time. But unless we are strategic planning, so this day, the third Saturday, this is the day that even God said, God speak concerning that day. That's why I came here. You can see other people know me. I don't go to receive a word just for the sake of the word and let you say. The third Saturday, the monument in Benin when they spoke, it fell down. Not just Benin. Many of you have heard about Rwanda. 2010, God said, God tell Rwanda, they will prosper, they will raise many women. We have gone in nations, speaking in society, by just simply leaders, meeting, thanking God, then God do the impossible. We don't know how he does, but he does because we have evidence. What about during the war? Because I told you, he wrote 1993. 1994, there was a war in South Africa. You knew about Mandela and the Botolese. God said, here in Washington, D.C., gather people on this day, the same day I told you. Let them thank me. Botolese and Mandela will reconcile. I know you all know the history. When we wrote Mandela and the Botolese will reconcile, leaders, government leaders came and said, it is impossible. I said, no, we'll just thank God. We don't know. We we'll just stand and thank God. We gathered at the AM in church here. Many didn't do it, but we just spoke, God take over. The same day God was doing miracles there. The faith-based initiative of White House here in the United States, it started during Bush administration. Why? The Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Tom Thompson, went to Africa, but I'm just saying different things, supernatural things that God can do. And here in America, and here in the UK, here in Church of Africa, and anywhere around the world, if you take this simple strategy, the third Saturday of every month, just thank you. You pray so much, you have all strategy of how to break this, break this. Thank God for that. We don't deny that. But once yeah, thank you. When Tom Thompson, you see, uh, you know, if you go maybe the government, I can't you find, but he's holding the flag. That flag you see, that unity flag, brings unity for us when you look, when you see we are one. In the continent, there's something that happens when you look, you see, you conceive. And God, now again, I'm confessing, I don't know everything about God. But one thing I know that I know that I know, when you obey, he does the impossible. There are many things he has done that were impossible, that he has fulfilled. You heard about COVID, all to cover the continent of Africa. He said, go to Africa, go raise the flag on top of Mount Kilimanjaro, the roof of Africa. That was 20 
18. Now when he sees God, it is when we meet him on that third Saturday that he, he drops strategies. He drops strategies. People hear what he said. So it was on the third Saturday when he said, go and raise this flag on top of the roof of Africa. I'll cover Africa with my glory. The ungodly agenda of Africa wouldn't succeed. We didn't know the leaders, we obeyed again, I said, we teach leaders, church leaders, political leaders, uh, civil servants, those who are willing who hear that God can use simple strategy, foolish things to change nations. So they went to March Kilimanjaro. We hosted that flag that we hear. We hosted that was 2018, 2019 when the call came. Ezekiel 34, if you read it, say, the land will be holy, will cover. The, the Kilimanjaro is in Tanzania. That's why Tanzania was never affected and Africa was covered. What am I saying to us? I could show you pictures of all people who have been transformed. Nations, you already know, Rwanda, what is happened, even Tanzania. Ask about Tanzania, the transformation. They might not know it is because there are people who are praying. You all know very well that when God raises leaders who will declare, that's why even our president decree to say we will have Thanksgiving Day in Tanzania and God covered that nation. So what am I saying to us, Africans or people of God? Right now, there is a city that is being transformed by one person. We believe you can change. One person, one community at a time, that's what we are striving for. And we thank you that you are here and you have heard me. I'm so glad to speak with you because I'm just obeying what God said that you say. Third Saturday, these flags are available if you want. You can come to donate so that we continue to build communities. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ. I am Pastor Francis A. M. Mambu, coming from Sierra Leone, a very small, tiny country with just a population of about 7.5 million people. Sierra Leone is a country that has gone through 10 year brutal river war. Two year Ebola pandemic, more slide, is a nation that has gone through terrible, terrible times. Uh, God, by His grace, during the river war, I have escaped the, the attacks of the river. I fell into a river ambush three times, and God has been faithful in keeping me alive. And having gone through, as a nation, terrible and difficult times, to be able to reach out to the gospel was difficult. And during the rebel war, after the rebel war, my prayer has been, God, how are we going to reach out to our people with the gospel? Because Sierra Leone was fortunate to receive the gospel almost over 200 years ago by a Baptist missionary that came from Africa to our country. But when they get to um, Sierra Leone, the gospel that they brought and the people in the land, it was a mixture of traditional uh, practices, together with the, the gospel. So it has been a bit difficult for us to separate the traditional practices from the real gospel. Because you can see a reverend, somebody who is professing to be a minister of the gospel, and he's part of the cult and the occult and the secret society. And as I'm speaking now, my life has always been under threat to be killed, because by God's grace, God has given us strategy, you know, as a nation or as a church. And 
Uh, God has, by His grace, provided a Christian radio, by a Christian radio and a television network by the name of Redeemer. And through that radio station, many Muslims and many cults and occult people have been surrendering their lives unto Christ by the special grace of God. Now, Sierra is a very poor country. We have a lot of minerals, but when you get to Sierra Leone, you will see of naked poverty. And you look at the educational level is very low. We only have about 69% uh, of illiteracy in the country. Only 31% literate. So then, even to preach the gospel, to penetrate into the interland, is a bit difficult. So I have been praying and asking God, God, what can I do to contribute in my own little way to spread the gospel out? And the Lord specifically told me about three major strategies. That if we are going to reach out to these people, when you look at the people in the provinces, we have about Almost about 79% they are subsistence farmers. And the farming that they do is not commercial farming. Whatever they grow, by the time you harvest, everything is finished. So if you are going to reach out to them, then you have to speak their language. So I now try to see what to do in reaching out to these people. We establish an agricultural project. We go into communities, we try to train the women because we have a, uh, an adage over there that the women are the breadbasket of the family. That if you can win the women, then you can win the entire family. So we now get into the uh, different, different communities. Presently, I'm working with over 600 women in various communities in the north, the south, and the east of the country. <laughs> I have a main farm. I grew there. I produce seed. Of course, Dr. D.K. has been there. We proceed. We, we, we provide seed for them. Uh, somebody provided me a second-handed tractor. So I used to use this tractor, of course, without the tractor is already is completely damaged now. We cannot work again, you know, in the tractor, but I've been providing seats for them, empowering these women in these various communities. And together with the gospel, God is helping us to be head way in some of these communities by the grace of God. Light is penetrating. Um, also, I call the pastors together to see how, what can we do, because Israel was opportune. So we have the gospel over 200 years ago, and now the Muslim population is about 77%. And when we talk about Christianity, it's something like between 25 to 30%, and we have about 3% of the animists that is traditional worshippers. So how are we going to evangelize these people? So I call pastors together, and we are trying to set up a church planting strategy. And by God's grace, up to now, as I'm talking, we have planted over 312 churches in the north, all over the country. And I was also praying and asking the Lord, say, God, what are we going to do to educate these people? Because I believe the Bible tells us about the mind as the man thinketh in his heart. That's what Proverbs 23, verse uh, 7 says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And having gone through the rebel war, some of our young, you know, youths, they were indoctrinated to kill, to cause mayhem, to do terrible, terrible things. How are we going to change the mindset of these people? So we have started establishing schools in some of these communities, we have already established about 25 primary and secondary schools in some of the communities. And also, three years ago, we have 
um, try to also create a discipleship schools for the churches. Because one of the problems also we are facing, you know, with the very little percentage of Christians is that um, very little has been done in the area of, you know, impacting knowledge and especially the area of training of disciples. So I started a discipleship school in the city three years ago, and we have graduated about 1,340 disciples and leaders. And as I'm talking now, by November, we'll be graduating 994 students in 14 campuses all over the country. And uh, yes, um, we we'll also have, because of the, the war, we have many, many, many kids who have lost their parents. So we have to set up an orphanage. Presently, we have over 200 orphans here in the Bulk District. That is the southern part of the country. And uh, I also try to bring uh, church leaders together. God blessing us with the radio and television station. Um, four years ago, we have started praying for revival. And every night, we use the radio because God has given us privilege and opportunity and favor. We go to past and the present government. So they have given us coverage. We have almost about 85% of the coverage all over the country that our radio and television is covered. So every night we organize church leaders in different churches, they talk together. We call it Revival Labor Prayer Group. So we have pastors and church leaders who are coming. And we pray every night from 11.30 to 4.30 a.m. in the morning. And as a result, of course, uh, Dr. Dike has gone to the radio station. He visited the farms and some of the villages, you know, some of the other places as well. And the Muslims, God is touching the Muslims. And many of them are giving their lives to Christ on daily basis. And finally, by God's special grace, we have a great redemption to say. It's a yearly annual program. We bring all churches together. Of course, uh, my beloved sister is here, Reverend Margaret Brandon. She has been working with us with the Great Redemption Crusade. It's a crusade that will host the, the National Stadium. You know, over 100,000 people who attend that crusade annually. And so, God, by His grace, is helping us. Although we have many challenges, but God is helping us, you know, as a nation, as a church, and as a people. So this morning, I'm privileged to be here and to share what God has been helping us to do in this video. God bless you. Thank you so much, thank you so much everyone. Uh, before we get to the question and answer session, I just wanna summarize a little bit what I understood from the powerhouses right here. Um, they have a lot of teams, um, Bishop Paul and Pastor Francis, his life is being threatened, right? Why? Because he's doing the right thing. Yeah. You know, change is something that's very static, but we don't like it. So, uh, the bishop was arrested how many times? Nine, Nine times. times. Because why? You're doing the right thing. As a leader, if people are not talking about you, you're not doing anything. <laughs> right? Mama Africa told us that transformation is critical. If you want to change, you have to change what you're doing. But whatever you're doing, if it is working, there's no need to change. If you're thinking about change, if it is not working, and for you to work together, there must be unity. Each and every one of us has something to bring for it to work. You can't be doing your own thing, I'm doing my own thing, you're doing your own thing, it's not gonna work. So what we said, we need units, especially leaders. I'm sure everyone here is a leader. So we have to be speaking with one voice. And Dr. Dike has given us that template. Dr. Dike is my own template for social change. I've been working with you for over 10 years. So what I said, mine, Dr. Gorgeous 
template for change, for you to make an impact, you have to say no to injustice. You have to say no to violence. You have to say no to crisis. You have to say no to what? Chaos. And you have to say yes to what? Justice. Equality. Good things. When you hear the back one, you say, you say something. And nothing, you say, when you hear something, you say something. So and that is the strategy that will move us forward in Africa. The church is the best place to start. The church. Dr. Dike has been to how many countries in the world? What is he talking about? Where is he visiting? Churches. Black people will believe in church. That's where you go to see the truth. That's where you go to get the truth. That's where you go and to expect to see people that will tell you the truth. So because we have that template created by Dr. DK, I think we are on the right path. We just to continue to do what we do best. So on this note, I'm going to you know, call for questions. I will go around with the microphone. If you have a question, just raise up your hand for that. Can we, sorry, can we get uh, one of the young folks to help move around the night? Can I say that? Sure, I think you want to sit wherever you want. Good morning. My name is Dr. Judy Fisher. I am an American, but I'm also Nigerian by my DNA. Oh. Oh. I'm Good morning, this sister. Morning, more than asking a question, <laughs> I thank God for each one of you. Because what you talked about, I am a missionary to Haiti. And I have experienced demonic oppression like you would never believe before. But so many people think because I stand here as a graduate, four times graduate of Howard University, I wouldn't believe in such scary stuff. I'm here to tell you the devil is real. I thank God for this conference because it lets me know that the people here know that you're fighting more than uh, flesh and blood. You're fighting the powers of hell. Do not want out Jesus Christ to be a woman. And education, and in darkness, all of those things I have been doing for over 30 years now in Haiti, I'm not giving up. I want to say thank you. Keep pushing how God is real. And folks, he does yeah. work miracles. Real miracles. God bless you. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, Just open the okay, first one and the show. We are going to continue with our Q&A, but we just want to recognize that the White House Faith-Based Cabinet Office Directors are here. Um, can you be recognized where you are so that we can see you all? And um, they will be doing the next sessions. We have invited them from the different departments, from education, from commerce, from Homeland Security, where because of the hurricane, Homeland Security is not going to be here, but we'll get Feeling on what they have to offer and help and human services and others. So you will have an opportunity to know how to engage our faith-based office in the White House. Can we take the other questions? In the yeah, room? we can take maybe two or three more questions and we'll round up the session. Is that okay? Right? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mama Africa. I have to say good morning to you. The Nigerians are winning, so let me say there's some Ghana blood flowing over here. Um, um, Dr. Dr. Pencil, thank you so much for everything that you shared. I, I wanted to ask a little bit about America, because I don't think it's by chance that we're all here. And my question has to do with how do we, as ministries, as churches, partner better to affect America? <laughs> I have three black boys, and when there are issues of violence, nobody asks are you from Africa or from America, it affects us all. So I wonder if any of our panelists really want to share a little bit more about churches and ministries and how we can impact inequity right here in America. Anyone can take the first step, yeah. Again, back to while we're here in America, I wish Pastor Bishop Weaver was here because I've been talking. If the churches again will unite, just be thankful. We are being, it sounds foolish, but if churches, wherever they are, they will unite, be thankful. God will give them strategies how to reach to the young people. Why I'm saying this, there were countries where they were fighting, killing each other. 
But when the churches, once they've been thankful, they go to those young people to talk. They need love, they need care, they need yes, acceptance. They will change. In Burundi, during the, the war fighting, there were children who were street kids, I don't know, in the, in the past there. I told them, I told them, that's call them. They said, no, this, you can't touch them there. When you hug them, you talk with love. People accept acceptance. So the church, if the body of Christ, will face love others, and they will be united, saying with one voice, change the world's come. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have okay, been in the United States a number of times. I've noticed that you have churches of just Caribbean people, churches of African people. We don't see the biggest with the people of the United States. Now, the message must not change, but the methodology ought to change. And we have a very, very good template in First Corinthians chapter 9. Where Paul says, I become all things to all men that I might win them to Christ. No. And so it is important if we want to impact America that the churches here need to seek God's guidance to know the kind of methodology that will Rolling. people will warm up to the American will warm up to so we can present the gospel to them. For example, in India, to reach, for example, the Brahman cats. Christians dress like the Brahman and exhibit love and reach them. So the message remains the same, but the methodology has to change. Thank you. So we're going to get the next question over here. Uh, good morning, Paul. Uh, my name is Dr. Nicholas Santo, and I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, one of the, during the conversations on the table, there was one conversation that caught my attention which is that of mental health. Um, this organization is doing a lot of good work in terms of spirituality and religion. But we understand that the principal causes of mental health, especially from an African perspective, is hunger, poverty, and a lack of health care. Well, currently we have a food factor, which is that of leadership. Leadership in the sense of our political leaders have not overdone their stay in power and not voting, omitting up with the needs of the people that pushes them into trauma. People's expectations have not been met. Where I come from, which is the English portion of Cameroon, we have been in war for six years and the war says nothing. So, I just want to ask, as being a member of this organization now, when are we going to go to English Cameroon, which has lost about 30,000? people to preach the word of God that can soften the hearts of the leaders. Thank you. I now respond to this. Mm -hmm. I will respond from my perspective. And um, Madam Stella, the Secretary of Peace Global Health Foundation, will also respond. When we talk about mental health, this is my area. I am a nurse, you know, a psych nurse. Mental health in our community, when I say community, people that look like me and you, you know, we don't talk about it. Yeah. And address mental health. We want to start from somewhere. We can go to Cameroon. We can go to Rwanda. From the other part, I'm the president and the co-founder of Peace Global Health Foundation. What do we do? We advocate. We educate. People that look like me and you about mental health, trauma, like uh, Pastor Francis has talked about what's going on in Sierra Leone. War upon war upon war upon war. Our leaders, are we talking about mental health? No. Do we have policies that say when somebody is depressed, this is what you can do? You can't, what you can do? Oh, don't go to their family and marry them because they have a depression. Don't go to their family and marry them oh, because they have anxiety in their but in here in U.S., when somebody is sick, they seek that help. So we're going to have to start from ourselves. That the little one we can do, that education, 
that, oh, I don't feel well today. Well, I need help. Mm -hmm. Not being biased, not thinking about what Angela is going to say when I say I don't feel well. Not thinking about what Joseph is going to say when I say I don't feel well. And then we need to in, talk to our leaders. Nigeria, Cameroon, Ghana, wherever we need to. But we can't talk to them if we are not united. Mama Africa said unity is the key. So we have to be united so that we can be bold and brave and talk to them. Madam Sela, I want to hear what you want to say. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes, we're talking about strategy in Christianity. What is, I would like to wanted to answer this question. When you look at the Catholic Church, they have planted structures all over. So what can we tap from them strategically? To, especially we're talking about reaching people in the U.S. Because for Catholic Church in the U.S., they are closing more churches than they are opening. Big, big houses are being closed. Big, big churches are being closed because they don't have pastors or they don't have priests. How can we tap into those already existing structures strategically to be able to, they call it a communism in Catholic Church, to be able to embrace Christianity, to be able to reach out to those people? Can we use already, like uh, St. Paul, somebody will say, reach to a place where they were worshiping what they were worshiping? What he used, did was to use the existing structure to reach out to the people around. So how do we use the decline in the Catholic Church or dispositions or the houses they really have to be able to strategically embroider our Christian faith? Thanks. Um, I think, um, like what we have already started in Sierra Leone, looking at where we are coming from, we are coming from the rebel war. We try to approach um, development holistically. Because when you get to some communities, you see that the healthcare is poor. You also see that there is no education for the children, no schools. You also see that you have the people have the land, but they cannot even grow food for themselves. Somebody has to be there to teach them. But I think for the church, for us to be strategic, we need to go back to the command that Jesus Christ gave us. That is where the church has missed it over the years. And that is the point of discipleship. The church cannot do effectively if we ignore that command that Jesus Christ gave. Unity will come when all of us Right, we are being established in the word of God. So, what we have started in Sierra Leone is that by God's grace, the discipleship school we have tried to establish it all over the country. Because if we are talking about love, right, the Christ kind of love has to come from the heart, and it takes Christ to transform the heart of the sinner, for him or her to love, to truly love. So I think the strategy for us to take over is that we should take the discipleship back into our churches. That is where we are going to start to get things done for the Lord as we are approaching his imminent return. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. I wanted to ask Dr. Pat this when we we're talking about the churches in America. I believe, uh, just like you said, uh, we need to go back to the foundation. When we forget about the foundation of the thing, every other thing that we build cannot stand. The church in America have to come out from the idea of talking only about the blessed me gospel, yeah. the prosperity gospel. People need to be rooted. People need to understand the word of God, the real word of God, the truth. Even with our children, we would need to bring them into the place that 
they understand that there must be a discipline. Yes. The Bible says it, and we have to follow suit. What is happening about the close of closure of churches? Most of the time, I look at it. The church was born with power. And it is only through what he was born with that you can sustain it with. If we are only considering and when we are strategic, and then it is only carnal or academic, and we forget about the power, it will not stand well. And so when I look into what is happening now, is that there must be a balance. And I thank God for the charismatic in Catholic Church that are trying to balance. And so when we go back to that power again, with all what we are putting into place, we find out that the church will be more balanced. Thank, Thank you. you. So we want to get one comment here, and then we will have a two, three minutes video we want to watch from one of our presenters that couldn't make it, and then we will round off. Not we stand round. I know we still have time, but more questions please put your questions together i'll collect them and we will, the speakers are still going to begin with us we want to make sure every question is answered but let's get this one comment here and then we watch that video thank you god bless you guys uh, it's a privilege to be here among you people you see unusual grace uh, my name is uh, dorothy nanga from cameroon I've been here 39 years. I come with the grace and the uh, prophetic that sense with the apostolic. What do I mean by that? I listen to her voice. How do we do? What do we do? She has boys. I have three boys. I have six brothers. Most of them are not in the church. Jesus said, go into all nations. And he said, by this only we know you are my disciples, my God, my Lord. We are in a building. We are not in the world. There is a gross veil of coverage covering our mind, distinguished and separating us. Why did I join Dr. Dickey? The reason I joined him because I cannot do it by myself. And my people in Cameroon, can they accept a prophet from their nation? No. But when I went to Cameroon, after studying here with Australian University, University of Mary, I didn't come to this country to become a pastor. I came to look for money. <laughs> I came to help my family because my father died suddenly. Now I went home in my house where Sierra Leone stayed. And when I equipped them, gave them money, so I took them back to Sierra Leone. I don't need to look for NGO for things. I need to connect. Seeds of kindness is missing among us. Yeah. Love is missing. Family has disappeared. We have failed God. We are doing racism in the body of Christ. Yeah. Racism among women. Women racism against women and men. Racism even when they bless you as a pastor to help other pastors, you will not. Dr. Dickey, I, I, I pray everybody will be a partner with this uh, African Caribbean network. If you hear African Caribbean as an American, you will say, no, you are not African Caribbean. Then you are deceiving yourself. We're together. They say, with me, let them be with me. Let everybody be connected. And let us walk as a unit. There is no Muslim among us. Jesus said all nations. Where are the Muslims? Jesus said everybody. Which church building is in heaven? Who has come back to tell us as a church building? <laughs> Listen, let us be to us. I pray that this moment I have, everybody here can be part of this great movement. So that we can make a difference. And the young people can see it with us mm -hmm. and see the difference and come. I saw the man of God trying to invite certain people. They don't want to come because they feel that it is nothing. No, we are moving. 
It does no matter whether it is the White House or the African White House. We are moving. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dr. DK, you have seen this. You are the template for social change. So, we are, everyone is in. Thank you so much. And I, on behalf of everyone here, I thank my panelists. Powerful one. Thank you so much for. I would not say we are close as the session officially still has what is due to end 10.45, right? Or 10.30, okay, so we are finished. I um, just want to make a quick point here, however. Um, I, I, the, in, the discussions have been very interesting, and I hear about discipleship and different Christian ecclesiology, um, how we can impact the world. Um, I just want to use the opportunity to remind us that we are in a faith-based environment. So we do have people that are from other faiths here that have been invited. We have our Muslim brothers and sisters. We have our Rastafari and others. And we don't have the followers, but we have the Some of them are the national or the international leader for um, these um, bodies as well. Um, one of the things that we try to engage is um, is how do we work not only as Christians together? I mean, my faith, I'm a Christian, but I see myself as somebody that operates daily in interfaith engagement because I engage people of other faiths every day. And one of the things we need to look at is how can we work together as people of faith when um, <coughs> Homeland Security, we engage in faith based center to the White House is dealing with um, the disaster. They can't look at you based on your faith. Disaster comes, it affects you. Immigration problem affects you no matter who you are. Crime and violence affects you no matter who you are. So we look at how do we manage when, okay, in the, in the midst of oppression and social justice, social inequality against us as a multicultural black community, when there, uh, when the colonialists or the white supremacists and others attack us or intertribal stuff, they don't look at your faith, they look at your tribe and your color. Because even in Nigeria, we have Igbos. It's a Christian tribe, but you have Muslims among the Igbos, among the Yorubas, among the Hausas. And the same way for the various tribes across Southern and Eastern, Western and North Africa. And in the Caribbean, just the same. So one of the things we need to focus on is how can we partner together to fight for social justice, for social change. That benefits all of us. And let me just say a few things that um, we're working on and I want you to think about. For example, for many years, we are trying to get immigration reform to happen in this country. 11 million people are living under the shadows. And maybe one or two million of them are from the African Caribbean community. And we normally engage the White House as a faith community. And one of the beauty about it is that because of the 14 faith based cabinet offices, we don't need to go for lobbyists. We can go straight to our faith based director and the department and engage. And they also represent the department. And one of the things we try to do is we talk about black immigration reform. Because we're not people that come here, like when they introduce the DACA program, the production for childhood arrival. Most African and Caribbean don't come here to childhood arrival at the borders, although we're concerned about those folks. But most people, 90, maybe 90% 90 of the African and Caribbean people that come to the US enter legally, but just falling between status, overstay, and stuff. So we don't believe people call us illegal entry. We're not illegal entry. We follow the status. But we together as a faith community voice the concern for all immigrants, you know, voice the concern against crime, you know, everything. So we look at how can we work together and how can we do that in your countries ecumenically. Um, I've dealt with some of you in Africa when we try to raise funds and offer aid overseas. I remember dealing with some folks in the Gambia. They connected me with the Islamic Council of Gambia the Islamic Council of Sierra Leone, the Islamic Council in Kenya. And that was beautiful that the Christian pastor says, look, we don't only need help. 
But we need assistance for the Muslims. We need assistance for the African indigenous religions that the Yorubas are the other. We hosted the King of Ife here representing the Yoruba people. So we just want to live with that consciousness that we must engage each other, people of faith, not just people that have the same ecclesiology or system of belief in terms of, of faith, but to think about them. Because at the last prayer of Jesus, he said, Father, I pray that they may all be one as we are one. It is Jesus who also said that there are other sheep that I have that I'm not of this fold. And so we have this opportunity to engage. And I'm happy that the federal government, one of the things I like about the United States, the most diverse nation in the world, but most diverse in terms of religion, is that this is the only country in the world that allows us to come and practice our religion in respective of who we are. And no other country we have such freedom as here in the United States. Just want to give a shout out to that. So um, thank you, Dr. Roboji. And I want to thank the mothers and fathers of the land. And I want to use this opportunity to say that some of you were on the list to be honored years ago. Like Pastor Mambo, Mama Africa. Five years we are trying to honor her now, but she's busy doing the job. She has no time for her work. She has no time for recognition. Finally, she's going to be available. She's just coming from Tanzania. So these are the people that we bring to get the Global Humanitarian Leadership Award from us at least you are that have to be a partner. We know you. We travel. We see what you do. It's not just somebody call us and send the resume. It doesn't work that way. So just know that we need to see before we bring you before the federal government and everybody and validate who you are. And so the global humanitarian leadership honorees, they are our top honorees. And we want you to congratulate them. And I think all of you fall in that category. So I want to congratulate you. We are going to get prepared to hear from those in the federal offices of the White House representing the Biden administration. But before we do that, thank you. We will have a brief one minute to two minute presentation by our African Diaspora Institute. We'll invite them to come. I was looking at them distinguishing the hotel this morning, never knew they were coming to this store. And they walked past me and they never know who I was either. So I invite you to come. Please let's have the video quickly. And um, immediately the yes, you will say the African Desert Forum. Um, we will invite the folks from the White House. Buckets, food 
titles, liquid soap and many more. As indicated, a clinic is set up on the very day, where over 150 medical personnel, including general practitioners, pharmacists, physiotherapists, ophthalmologists and dentists, take care of thousands of patients who come through the clinic. From consultation through to pharmacy, all services rendered are free to the patient. There is also the medical mission phase where persons with disabilities who need surgical operations are screened and scheduled for surgery. Over the past seven years, Day of Health has made tremendous contributions and impact across the country. CEM and its partners spend more than two million Ghana cities each year. There is however more to be done. We have the responsibility to support and encourage persons with disability to realize their dream and live fulfilled lives. This requires a long strategic plan to help transform the lives of persons with disabilities. To this end, Reverend Dr. Steve Mensah and the CEM launched the Ability Village project which seeks to establish a disability-friendly community that allows persons living with disabilities to live productive and meaningful lives with other abled individuals. Welcome to the Ability Village, a place of hope and support. Welcome to the future where we can all live and grow together. The Ability Village will include assisted living conditions, affordable housing, a hospital and social care services including shadow activities advocacy guidance and information services. Education will be an essential component of the community with persons with disabilities having access to vocational training, education for children with disabilities, and general skills development for the job market. Skills development will include the creation of an environment which promotes rigorous economic activity that empowers individuals, families, and the community as a whole. The village will also drive communal economic growth under four thematic areas disabled in agriculture, a retail commercial center, a technology hub, and a light industry park. Let's join hands and make this dream a reality. We are happy to walk this journey with you, and together we can achieve some important social economic imperatives by cohabiting and supporting persons living with disabilities. Take a stand. Stand with persons with disabilities. For more inquiries, kindly contact Fred Wood on 020-979-9911. God bless you for taking a stand with persons living with disabilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
My name is Bishop Dr. Tony Luck, and I have the privilege to serve under Her Excellency Ambassador Erica Bennett, the Chief of Mission and the founder of the Diaspora Africa Forum. We're located at the historic Du Bois Center in Accra, Ghana. And what we just showing you here is we have a sixth region flag that represents the diaspora. Now, I said I was a bishop, so y'all need to say amen. amen. <laughs> y'all need to clap. Y'all need to excited because for many years, we're not recognized as part of the African family. We're African-American, African-Caribbean, African, wherever, but not part of the African family. And thanks to this amazing man who's standing here, we call him our avatar, our Professor Ado. <laughs> He created this flag. And it was at the impetus of her, can you feel like standing up? She's not a hundred, but let's, let's welcome our ambassador. <laughs> this is her excellency, Ambassador Erica Dennis, stay standing. We are the only diplomatic mission recognized by the African Union in the world that represents you. Can I? represent the five regions. How many of you know there are five regions in Africa? Don't be shamed because some of you don't. See, there are five regions in Africa. West, North, East, South, and Central. Yes. Somebody say yes. yes. I want to do my little two minutes. And this lightning bolt, you can stand up. Is this is this the White House? Oh, please come here so you can see it. <laughs> We need the White House to understand this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. DK. We need the White House. No, really. Yes, we do. We, can someone say yes, we do? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm putting on my preacher hat. Can I put on my preacher hat yes. for one minute? Yes. Okay. Amen. Thank you, Please let the White House see this. <laughs> the reason why this is so critical is because these five regions have been struggling so long. And a lot of its brain drain, its money, its heart is in this star. This star is the diaspora. Hundreds of millions of people are in this star. And it is pushing itself into Africa to be useful, to be helpful, to be knowledgeable, to share the resources, to go back home, Sankofa, to go back home. And we need to be able to have a coordinated effort. And the reason I'm so happy you're here as faith-based people is because there had been a policy many, many years ago to separate this from this. But it was United States policy. And the reason I can say that is because I used to be United States policy. So I'm not talking about what I don't know. Then I got to be African and I went home. <laughs> But now, if you see these two ends are, are touching Africa, because in order for the world to move forward, this continent is, is the hope of, of the world. That's right. And if these two pieces do not come together with the help of United States and other countries of which you have such a large population of us, and if we stop voting, stop paying taxes, America will really feel that. That's true. Uh -huh, look. Yeah. All right. So this flag is your flag. It was inspired by the ambassador and developed by Professor Doe, but it belongs to the diaspora. It belongs to the African diaspora. This is your flag, and here it is. We have a real flag. Yeah. We have a real flag. So our ambassador has decided that it's free. I'm, I'm the money person, and I don't want it to be free. But it's free, so you can go on our website, www.diasporaafricaforum.org, and you can download the flag. And you can put it in your office. We have these small ones, which we're going to give to the White House. Take it back and put it on your desk. You can print it, you can show it, 
it's yours. Can we say amen? Amen. Can we say hallelujah? Hallelujah. And I just want to say one other thing. This gentleman here, you see, we dressed. We came dressed as Ghana. This is our Ghana delegation. And we have with us Chief Crystal, who is, please stand, who is the largest communication company in Africa. His network, Global Channel, reaches over a billion people every day. So we want you, before he leaves, to be in touch so you may have something to say, you may want to share. And then my last two minutes is Yeshua, his original Hebrew name, tells us, everybody's talking about strategy. I wasn't asked to go to town, because we were still be there. He says one thing, we don't need a strategy. He's told us, John 21, 14, 15, and 16, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. The reason we have so much problems in Africa, people are hungry. Feed them. Not the gospel. They'll get the gospel while you're giving them bread. They'll get the love of God because the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is love. That's right. And when you're feeding hungry people, they feel the love. And we as the diaspora can do that. So let's embrace one another. Let's help America upgrade their policy and let them see that this connection is the connection that's going to save the world. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I like the energy. And that is what it's like when African and Caribbean people come together. We are one people with one common destiny. And most importantly, our heritage is from the motherland, Africa. We were brought as slaves. Some were dropped off in Barbados, Haiti, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, and various parts of the United States. But we are all relatives. Sometimes one family was captured, and one brother was in Trinidad, and the other brother in Haiti, and the other brother in Jamaica, and the other brother in America. Never get to see each other again, and that's why we so much look alike. One people with one common destiny. And um, we are happy that years ago, I think it was from, from President Obama went into office 2008. I was a student, a doctoral student at Howard School of Divinity, and um, most of you know that the White House Faith Based Office was established from when President Bush was president. He first established the Faith Based Office of, at the White House. And I think it was subsequently to establishing the Faith Based Office at the White House, he stated that the faith community must be seen as very essential stakeholders in our community for partnerships. And one of the quotes I like from President Bush was when he said that the faith community are there before the disaster. The faith community are there during the disaster. And the faith community will always be there after the disaster. And he said it at a time when President Obama requested him and the President Bill Clinton to be envoys during the earthquake in Haiti. Because even at that time, there's so many nonprofits that rise up doing stuff for Haiti to get money, and then nobody sees them again. But one of the things we have to remember when we talk about faith communities is that we are always there. We are the most essential part of the community, and especially the African and Caribbean community. If you want to get to the diaspora, although we have hundreds of indigenous diaspora organizations, from the United States, when I, I mean thousands, I should say, because just Nigeria diaspora here alone, I'm not talking about the numbers, but organizations 
you have the evil groups. Then in the, within the evil, you have the morale, you have the, you have the, oh, 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 um, an number group, you know, and all the various groups within one tribe, all have registered organizations, and it goes like that from tribe to tribe. And by the time you count, it's thousands of indigenous registered nonprofits here. Then you have maybe over 12,000 churches with the Redeemed Christian Church as the largest with about 1,300 churches here. Mountain of Fire, Church of Pentecost, those are Ghanaian churches, New Testament Church of God, Church of God of Prophecy, Caribbean base. Then we have 14 Francophonian groups here from the French countries, and if you add Haiti, it's 15, and they have numerous churches here, from Congolese churches, to Togolese churches, to Ivory Coast churches, to Haitian churches, right throughout. And so we have been, from the time I remember looking for a job when I left Howard and nobody would hire me. And I was given the opportunity to volunteer for the Institute of Caribbean Studies to help the White House to work in bringing together the Caribbean faith-based um, leaders. And then the Africans saw what we were doing and requested, why can't we be a part? But they were coming and then the, one of the draw was that the White House would allow us to have the reception there and the briefing, and so it was a draw. And that's what led to the merger of what we call the Caribbean and African Faith-Based Leadership Conference. We wanted it to be Africa, but it was started, and it was about three years as a Caribbean-based organization with the backing of the Caribbean diplomats and the Caribbean Congressional Caucus, and of course, our Caribbean associates in the White House were very instrumental, like Michael Blake, Eva Pastor, and a number of them. And so here we are today um, with maybe 80% participation from Africa. And we grew from being domestic to being very international. And we engage as far as our African churches in Asia, South Korea, um, Japan, London, Amsterdam, all over. And so folks look forward to coming here to engage. And so we normally engage with USAID and engage with the Department of State. We want to say to thank you, Reverend Dr. English, for the work you have done in bringing together the faith-based partners. We miss Michael, not Michael, we miss oh. We miss Homeland Security. Marcus. Marcus, you know. One of the things is that Marcos has been coming to this conference before it became the Caribbean and African Baby Conference. Oh. He has been coming from, it was only a Caribbean American Big Base Conference. The first conference at that time was at the Hilton Hotel. And then when we merged with Africa, we had it at the Organization of American State, with Chaplain Barry Black as our first speaker. And Marcos has been with us all these years, and we really miss him. He's not here with us. He's a currently Biden's senior faith-based advisor to the Department of Homeland Security. We miss Marcus, but there's a hurricane going on, and the White House is stretching the staff, and so we regret that he could not be here with us today. But we are very, very happy that you have made it to be here with us today. Um, they are going to share the opportunities for engagement. We will have opportunities for interaction. We are anxious to hear more about what is on the agenda of President Biden and how can we engage. Um, the, 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 an administration ago, the name was changed to White House State and Opportunities. And um, I was able to work with them on the religious freedom conferences and so on. So we are a few folks here. I'm going to make an attempt to do a brief introduction, and Miss English will help us out, Reverend Dr. English. Very interesting name. And um, so we have with us from the centers of the faith-based office, and I must say there's some good news, because I hear that we have an office in Hutt, and that is good news, and the Department of Commerce. So we have with us from the centers today, Reverend Dr. Q English, Director, Partnership Center, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We have Conrad Washington, Director of Partnership Center, U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. It is nice, I think it's the first. We have the Veteran Affairs Director with us. Then we have 
Andres Chung, Kwai Torres, you can pronounce it correctly if I got it wrong, Director of Partnership Center, U.S. Department of Commerce, I think that's where the money is, <laughs> and then we have Maggie Sidiqui, Partnership Center, U.S. Department of Education. Education and Human Services and Homeland Security, State Department, USAID, are like brothers and sisters to us over the years. Mm -hmm. Ken Bidell, a former senior advisor for the U.S. Department of Education, was one of our honorees mm -hmm. and strong supporters up to this day. Um, he worked with President Obama. So we want to thank you all for coming, and I will now hand the mic. They will come and share to Miss English, who will start off, and we will take it from here. Put your hands together for our Thank you, I am just so honored uh, to be here. Love this sign, praying for Africa again, and Reverend Dr. Q English. I'm glad to be joining you today for my first 22, 2022, and hopefully not the last, um, African and Caribbean International um, Conference. And before I get started, if you have Twitter, we'd love for you to follow us at HHS Partnership. That's HHS Partnership. And just a quick story, you know, I've been to South Africa and Kenya. I used to pass days just to work with Bishop T.D. James. But then I went to Lagos as uh, the speaker at their women's conference, and they were struggling whether or not to determine what tribe I was really from. Yes. Yes. And it was either Igbo, right? Yeah. Or, or Yoruba. 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 Okay, okay. So they were torn between the two. But they did grace me with a name that I will never forget. And I embrace for the rest of my life. And that is Chioma. I'm your sister. Igbo's in the house. So I was just blessed to uh, be graced with that name when I was in Lagos, Nigeria, with my friend, Dr. Anna Harrison. So as mentioned, I am the director of the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where the Honorable Javier Becerra serves as the secretary. And I'm equally honored just to be here with my fellow center leads that are doing incredible work. I love our partnership and our movement together. And our center exists to strengthen the response of faith and community organizations to critical public health and human services issues. At the center, we have five strategic initiatives this year. One is the continued work around COVID-19, increasing vaccinations, increasing boosters. Number two is maternal health. Why? Because the United States has the highest maternal mortality, which is death, rate out of all of the developed countries in the world. And to that, the maternal mortality rates among black women are three to four times higher than white women. And some countries, in some states rather, it's even higher. In New York, it's nine to 12 times higher black women dying than white women. And the number one cause is mental illness. The third focus area is substance of use disorder addiction, inclusive of overdose prevention and prenatal abstinence syndrome. Um, I'm pleased to announce that our Central's toolkit is made, has been made available, so we definitely want you to connect with us. We do have a substance use disorder toolkit for the faith community. We have a youth mental health toolkit that's going to be released that we would like to share. And I'm finishing up our Faith in Action on Maternal Health Guide for our faith community, so I do want to stay connected after this. The fourth focus area is mental health and youth, and our fifth is suicide prevention. So for today's conversation, I'm going to briefly highlight where we are as a nation as it relates to mental health and suicide prevention and how we are addressing it at the Department of Health and Human Services. This month, September, is National Suicide Prevention Month. First, our country faces an unprecedented mental health crisis among people of all ages. Two out of five adults report symptoms of anxiety or depression. And we, as faith leaders, we know we are not exempt from that. And even before the pandemic, rates of depression and anxiety were inching higher. 
But the grief, trauma, and physical isolation of the last two years have driven Americans to a breaking point. Our youth has been particularly impacted as losses from COVID and disruptions in routines and relationships have led to increased social isolation, anxiety, and learning loss. Suicide is Suicide is actually the second leading cause of death among young people and was the 10th leading cause of death in the nation in 2019, according to CDC and the prevention data. So on December the 7th, 2021, our U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, issued a public health advisory that warned of a crisis among youth. He wrote, mental health challenges in children, adolescents, and young adults are real and are widespread but most importantly, they are treatable and often preventable. So in 2021, mental health in children was declared a national emergency. And according to the National Association of Mental Illness, one in six youth aged six to 17 experience a mental health disorder each year. And NAMI also reports that black adults living below the poverty line are more than twice as likely to report serious psychological distress than those with more financial security. But despite the needs, only one in three black adults who, may, who need mental health care receive it. And we are very much aware of the barriers to mental health care from socioeconomic disparities to access, and then there's stigma. One study showed that 63% of black people believe that a mental health condition is a sign of personal weakness. And as a result, people may experience shame and about having a mental illness and worry that they may be discriminated against due to their condition. Fear also could prevent people from seeking mental health care when they really need it. And I have to say on a personal level and a matter of personal opinion, we adhere to one of the most damaging, destructive, life-altering statements ever to exist, comprised in one statement. What goes on in the house, stays in the house. And some things need to come out of the house. Some things needed to come out of my house growing up, things that were linked to adverse childhood events, also called aces later in life from addiction, to other things that with proper attention could have been avoided or at least minimized. My father, you know, you go into my kitchen cabinet, there was more medicine bottles than there were dishes. You go on the street, you see that person pushing the shopping cart with matted hair, cans in the shopping cart, that was my brother. You see people occupying prisons and substance use disorder, dying from opioid and overdose addiction and HIV AIDS, that was my brother. And so some things needed to come out of the house that we kept contained in the house, and if it had come out of the house, perhaps we could have minimized the impact. I want to say, let the church say amen. <laughs> so something needed to come out of my house. Some things have to come out of the house. Their pie, we're actually prioritizing the mental wellness of our families. Now turning our attention as I get ready to close to the issue of suicide. As I mentioned, this month is National Suicide Prevention Month. In early 2021, U.S. Emergency Department visits soared by nearly 51% for suspected suicide attempts among adolescent girls ages 12 to 17 and 4% in adolescent boys. In 2019, one death by suicide happened almost every 11 minutes in the United States. But here's what you need to hear. Suicide rates among black children for the first time below age 13 have been increasing rapidly. With black children nearly twice likely to die by suicide than white children for the first time. The suicide death rate among black youth has been found to be increasing faster than any other racial or ethnic group. And we also need to pay attention to the social media platforms our youth engages on. As the Surgeon General has said, when not deployed responsibly and safely, these tools can pit us against each other, reinforce negative behaviors like bullying and exclusion, and undermine the safe and supportive environments young people need and deserve. 
In the State of the Union, the President then called on Congress to strengthen privacy protections, ban targeted advertising to children, and to demand technology companies stop collecting personal data on our children. The President announced a national mental health strategy to strengthen system capacity, connect more Americans to care, and to create support transforming our health and social services infrastructure to address mental health holistically and equitably. So the country needs to shore up, it was said that the country needs to shore up, scale up, and staff up. And this is what we've done. The administration has put $177 million to strengthen and expand the existing lifeline network operations and telephone infrastructure, including centralized chat, text response, backup center capacity, and special services, and $105 million to build up staffing across local crisis call centers. And to that end, Health and Human Services announced critical investments to implement the 988 dialing code for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So it's 10 digit number, we can now refer people to 988. And in my closing, the implementation of 988 marks a significant step forward in strengthening access to care for 39 million Americans who experience suicidal, mental health, and substance use challenges each year. So at this time, I want to turn it over to my colleague, and right before I do, I want you to know that we, as faith leaders, our doors, it has been proven, are the first place those that are suffering with mental health issues and mental illness is where the first place they come. So we can do more by educating ourselves, by becoming certified in mental health first aid, mental health youth first aid, and other things. There are things that we can do within our houses of worship. And there may be opportunities for you to have a mental health clinic right there in your house of worship. You may have that capacity. So again, I definitely want to connect with you after um, this is over. I want to leave you with a familiar scripture text found in Galatians 6, 9, according to the New Living Translation. It says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. Because at just the right time, we're going to reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Thank you. Thank you. I may have to dip out at, right at noon. I have another call, but I will be available after. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Andres Tronqui Torres. Some of you may be wondering, man, where are you from? Like, where did you come from? My father's ascendancy uh, is Chinese. They migrated to Ecuador in the early 1900s. Uh, my father is in the back, uh, right there, taking a video. Uh, he's visiting Washington, D.C., so it's an exciting time. Um, he, uh, he raised me well in the ways of the Lord. Raise your child in the ways of the Lord. And, and the path will be set, and that's what he did. In, in most pivotal years of my youth, um, he was there to give me the right steady hand that I needed uh, to become the man I am today. So I want to recognize him. Uh, he fell in love with my mother in Ecuador, so that's my background. I'm a Chino Latino. <laughs> um, you guys can read uh, about information on our website. I'm not here to do that. I'm here to talk to you about experiences and stories. When I see your faces, I see my neighbors. I see my mom, my grandma, my aunties. And when I see your faces, I see people of action. And you make come as a common sense to me uh, to start with a vision, to chart a path for a particular uh, goal that you have. But believe it or not, in government, it's not so clear cut sometimes. And the word says that a people without a vision perish. And so this is why the work that you do is so important. And so today, I want to tell you what I do. Uh, I advise the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary of Commerce uh, on job creation and economic growth as it pertains to our communities to our most vulnerable communities. And the story I want to tell you today is about what happens on the ground when we organize. 
So my job is to promote impactful partnerships between businesses, faith-based organizations, and community-based organizations. And make sure that you guys have access to all the billions of dollars, technical assistance, trainings, uh, and access to data innovation that are available right now. So there's a ding, ding, ding moment that may not come back. I've worked at Treasury before and other agencies in US government in the past, in the Obama administration as well. And this level of intentionality into working with our communities I've never seen before. So this is something that we have to see, guys. Let me tell you the stories. When we go underground to work with priests, bishops, imams, rabbis, people of all faiths, the question comes up, why do we go to our communities of faith and faith-based organizations at the end of the conversation? We need to switch and, and, and change that paradigm. These are the folks that are there for you when there's a hurricane, when you have a divorce, when you lost your job. Who do we go to? We go to these leaders of faith, we go to the Lord. And so my, my personal sense is that this switching paradigm is the beginning of the conversation. And so, as we take our space, as we start filling in those, those roles, like Reverend Q English has very well laid out, and how my partners, you see, it takes not just vision, but it takes persistence, it takes a level of, of grace to continue to do the work and not grow up tired like Reverend English said. And so, there's $48 billion coming in for NTIA, for high-speed internet connectivity. And let me tell you, the real impact is when we go to the churches and we help our brothers and sisters sign up for the affordable connectivity programs uh, opportunities. And I saw that happening on Saturday at the Black Churches for Digital Equity event uh, at Martha's Table. It takes that level of hand-holding. It takes that level of hard work. When you talk about MBDA, Minority Business Development Agency opportunities, the ability for us to go to our businesses and say, guys, Here's a table, here's a conversation that you need to be a part of, and here's how you can access this opportunity. That's my job. And so I told the secretary, ma'am, we can have you do speeches, we can have you do these kinds of engagements which are great for amplification, or we can go on the ground and set round tables across the country to ask the people what they need. Not what we think is important to you guys, but what you think is important to you guys. And so, as we identify, assess, and execute on those needs across the United States, I invite you guys to get in touch with me because, again, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's not just a hold of commerce that I'm here to talk about. It's to amplify the work of my colleagues in all the other agencies across the United States government. And it's not just the billions of dollars. Like I said, it's our agency. It's our organizing. When we build momentum the way you guys are doing right here in this room, there's no way for them to say we didn't listen, we didn't hear you. Because we're pressing every conversation. And that's our job, is to bring your equities to the center of the table. Not just at the table, at the center of the conversation. And that takes intentionality. And so, as we grow in this movement, I beg you, follow us, email us at commerce, faith-based neighborhood partnerships at doc.gov. Let's get those round tables started in your state. I wish you could be there and see what the Ohio table does, the Florida table does, because it matters, guys. Right now, as we're getting pummeled by a hurricane in Florida, that's where I'm from, these conversations on the ground with priests and community-based organizations allowed us to change what has been done wrong in the past. So when they put our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters displaced after a hurricane in food deserts or uh, in places where they can't find jobs, our Haitian brothers and sisters, Caribbean brothers and sisters that go through this issue every year almost due to climate change, we have to make sure we bring your voice to the table and advocate for our African and Caribbean communities across the United States. That's why it's important so that when the $3 billion come in from NOAA for climate resiliency, that money and those resources can go to the right hands. And so, is someone fired up in here? Because I, I, I'm really fired up by it. I want to finish with, with another thought. 
in each one of the, the, the benefit of working on the ground is to get the pulse of our community, right? Yep. Yeah. And so when I see that over 90% of applications for patents and trademarks are from white Americans, that's yeah. phenomenal, right? Great. But imagine the potential we have right there for African young inventors, or Latino young inventors, or Caribbean young inventors, to patent and trademark their inventions, to learn how to do it. Is someone getting excited here? Because that's the future, and that's the vision you're charting here. Am I right? And so we have to step in. We have to lean in. And we have to be at the table to make our communities, to make that knowledge known to our communities. So when I see that young man patenting the trademark invention and embracing his entire family, his entire community, I see change. Yes. When I see our communities connected with high-speed internet, I see change. When I see our small businesses at the table receiving the grants all the way from the moment they apply, hand-holding all the way to when they get it, I see change. When I see our communities becoming not just the people that you go to to cry onto after a catastrophe, but when we see people, our leaders, leaning in from the beginning to make our houses of worship houses of resiliency, to lift up our communities, I see change. Yeah. And that's where our vision lies, my friends, today. Yeah. Get in touch. Let's get this conversation started in your state. I'm going to stay here to talk about that. May God bless you. May God bless the United States. May God bless Africa. Amen. May God bless the Caribbean. Amen. Let's continue the work. Thank you so much for this space. Um, that you may have heard it was launched uh, this 
This past summer, the White House a nationwide three-year effort that brings together experienced organizations to recruit, screen, train, support, and engage an additional 250,000 caring adults and roles serving as tutors, as mentors, student success coaches, wraparound service coordinators, post-secondary transition coaches, because we don't want to make sure we are leaving to chance that every child has a caring adult in their life to succeed. Right? So often, we leave it to chance. Yeah. And some students yeah. have got it, and some students don't. Yeah. We want to make sure that every student has that caring adult in their life. And this is important. So I encourage you to go to partner, partnershipstudentsuccess.org. Partnershipstudentsuccess.org. Um, there you can, you know, we really need faith communities to help put out the call um, for those individuals that, that tutor and mentor so many of your organizations are already doing that work. Um, we want to get connected, right, so we can see where those gaps are um, and where those caring adults are needed most. Um, second way that we really love to connect with you all and, and work together is around fostering the values of religious literacy religious pluralism, religious freedom. I've heard that was something that, uh, that you all work on quite a bit as well. I don't know if you heard, a couple weeks ago, the White House held the United We Stand Summit um, to talk about how to foster unity, to push back against hate. And one of the key features of that was on faith and community. Last week, um, you know, Marcus Coleman's uh, office, right, the Department of Homeland Security, um, Center for Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnership hosted the Protecting Places of Worship Week of Action over at the White House. Several of us were there as well. We want to make sure across the administration that no one is living in fear of being targeted or harmed while they go to pray because of who they are uh, when, they, when they are engaged in worship. And we know our schools play a critical role in attending to the social and emotional needs of youth fostering that strong sense of unity. So we're gonna be absolutely a part of that work. We also know that we wanna keep kids safe when they're in school. And we wanna ensure that students of all religious backgrounds and none are able to access an education without fear of bullying, harassment, discrimination, or violence. So that's another thing we'd love to work on in partnership with you all. I'm happy to follow up further on, on what that looks like, because there's gonna be a lot to do we all coming up really soon. Um, and then lastly, you know, one of the things we get asked about a lot are resources um, that are available for the department. And much of that funding, I will say, is directed through state and local educational agencies and institutions of higher education. Not all the time. Um, and so sometimes the state or local governments are the best places to look for those federal funding. Getting government resources you know, is not so clear cut. <laughs> so that's what we are here to help you do. That is what we are here to help you do. So absolutely seek us out as a resource. Say, I'm looking for funding opportunities in this state. I'm looking to do this kind of work, and we will help you navigate that process. And there are opportunities that are available directly to, to nonprofits. Oftentimes, um, nonprofits that are engaged in formal partnership with educational institutions. So again, this work is very locally based. And so we need all of you. We need the houses of worship you work with, the faith-based social service organizations you work with. They can all get access to that funding for the work that they are doing, and we would love to connect with you. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring the, the, the preaching with me today. <laughs> my, my colleagues. Um, but I'm so grateful to be connected with all of you, and, and yes, hope this is not the last conference that I get to, to join here. Good morning. Good morning. So if I was preaching, I'd ask you to stand up and let's give God some praise, but I have to remember that I don't have that head on right now. <laughs> so look, I, I'm really moved at the spirit of love and, and inclusion and unity, and I really appreciate that. It was mentioned earlier, uh, the attributes of our creator of love. So uh, as the director for the VA, the Department of Benefit Affairs Center for Faith, we show our love by extending information and resources to veterans and families and beneficiaries. You all know what veterans do. I think the uniform on the sacrifice that we may have uh, a right to freedom, right? And so we decided about <laughs> And yes, I am a retired Marine veteran, combat veteran, so you know. Uh, so, wow. so 
Now, just a couple of things. Uh, Reverend Dr. English mentioned that uh, we're in the last few days of Suicide Prevention Month. And as you know, that's very important to veterans because uh, that's the department's number one clinical priority, right? It's so much so that we have a, an office led by Dr. Miller uh, for suicide prevention. So our office, the office I'm responsible for, we support, uh, obviously, suicide prevention. She talked about 98 number, that's important. Uh, so uh, previously we had 1-800-243-7255, uh, uh, press 1 if you're a veteran. But 988 makes it very simple for those who are uh, struggling. And we know that faith leaders across the nation, as myself, I'm a preacher, right? Uh, we deal with many, many issues across the nation. And faith, our faith leaders, clergy leaders from all denominations, they are the front door to our veterans, to our people, to our communities, right? So it's a protective factor. What does that mean? If you're having an issue, you're gonna to go to people who you feel comfortable with so that you can share information and grow. So suicide prevention is one of our initiatives. Uh, we also have some other initiatives going on. I'm not gonna bore you, but uh, veteran service groups, if you are in a, uh, an organization right now, or you wanna start an organization that can support veterans, you need to contact me or my office. I'm not gonna give you the, uh, the, the, the website, just go to Google and type in Department of Veteran Affairs Center for Faith, and you'll get to our website, right? Is that good? Yeah, and you can share uh, your information with us. We'll contact you on how to start a veteran service group. Uh, we know we have about 20 million veterans across the nation right now, right? And less than half of those veterans are connected to VA services for various reasons. Some of them got church hurt, as we said back in the day, right, church hurt? Some got VA hurt, right? So every time I go out and talk across the nation, I tell people, I know you may have been hurt by someone in the VA, but give us another chance. Right? Don't we tell the same people the same thing when they come down to get prayed for and lay hands on and some of them sit in the pews and they're uh, uh, bleeding profusely, not physically but spiritually, but they never come down, they never get prayed. We tell them, don't let yourself sit there and bleed out. There's someone here who wants to help you. So that's the message I send to people across the nation. Uh, so quickly, some other things going on. Uh, our secretary who leads the department, uh, Dennis McDonald, uh, is very excited about the opportunity to work with clergy leaders from all denominations, so we're ecumenical. We, in my office, we host events across the nation. I just came back from Greenville, North Carolina uh, last week, and uh, we had a round table. Uh, my colleague talked about round tables. They're very important because we want to bridge the gap between community and clergy in those round tables. We have to find out what is needed in each geographical location. So I promote and uh, you know support round tables. If you need to reach me, please go to Google, and uh, VA's here, be blessed. Because uh, Andres has to step out for a call with the secretary. He's going to be back. Dr. DK, so we have to take a photograph. A photograph. Yeah. You want a photograph with me? Yes. Can I have our global humanitarian honorees line up just to get a quick shot too? The global? That's good. Yeah. Traveled all the way from Africa. Dr. Weaver, you're one of them. We just want to make it free. Can you see how it works? Bishop Weaver, the global, the global. We have so many past honorees here today, like Dr. Fisher as well. Yeah, I thought it was wrong. Okay. Okay. No, it's okay. Stop on my door. I'm going to take a look at your door, please. Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm going to ask him for at least one minute to photograph. We have this. All the photographers. Okay, ready? Not yet. Planning committee, line up quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Planning committee, line up quickly. Okay. You may make your way up here. And we're looking for it to see you tonight. Look at the photo we have. It's royal, 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 roy